All right, let's go ahead and get started with our next session here. Um, but before we do that, I kind of want to play another game here. I have a photograph on my phone here. And I want you to guess what this photograph is with yes or no questions. And so I'm going to answer yes or no questions. And you're going to ask me whatever you want. And we'll see how many questions do you think you need before you can tell what this photograph is. First, let's take a guess. How many questions do you think we're going to need? A ballpark. Paul. 20. Okay, Paul says 20 questions. All right, first question, Paul. Uh, is it an animal? It's not an animal, no. Just yell them out. I'll go quick. Yeah. Is it alive? No. Is it a place? No. Is it a place? No. No. Is it solid? Yes. Is it man made? Yes. Is it something in this room? It's man made. Black and white. No, not black and white. Is it something? It's not in this room. Is it on planet Earth? It's on planet Earth? Is it smaller than planet Earth? It's not smaller than planet Earth. Is that computer? No. That's... How many questions do we have? 15. Keep going, keep going, come on. How many do you compare? Yes. Can you eat it? No. Typically indoors? Yes, maybe. That's a hard one. Is it something you can carry in your pocket? Not most pockets. <laughs> Use a pocket. Is it the same as an object? Yes. Is it round? It has round components. <laughs> <laughs> is it used in deep Is there a phone? Not a phone. Yeah, I, don't remember, I don't remember if this was asked. Is it man made? <laughs> yes, it's man made. Can it be turned on? Cannot be turned on. Does it bounce? It would. Is it metallic? <laughs> <laughs> it's not metallic. <laughs> Not metallic. Is it alive? No. Nope. Is it what? Sound. Sound? No. Is it a basketball? No. You guys are going to the specific. So the point is, right, photographs have millions and millions of images. You'll be able to get this in a second. I'm not going to tell you, but, right, we, if we were to have to add, guess what's the pixel of it, you know, what's the, the brightness of each pixel, that would be millions of questions. And you're almost there. Keep going, right? I bet you'll get it in just a few more questions. Uh, yes. What was the question? Can you hold it in your Is it used to play sports? Is it a tennis racket? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a ball. Ball. If it can no. see, is it a ball? Wait, if, if it can see, it doesn't see at the same time. Say what? If it sees, it doesn't see at the same time. No. He hit things with it. No. Is it heavy? No. Do you wear it? Do you wear it? And you wear it? You could. Is no one. No one does. So if you throw it at the ground, it won't break. Uh, I wouldn't. I don't think this one would. Is it used for a specific task? task? Yeah, it's used for a specific thing. Is it, is it a tool? Is it a tool? Uh, you could generally, a uh, tool will be a stretch. Has everybody here used one? Yes. Has everyone used one? You wear it? No. That's already been used. Is it common Keep that on. somebody here might have one? Yeah. Is it a shoe? No. <laughs> does, does everyone here have one? Uh, you might at some point. You don't have one now on your person, maybe, but probably had it one time. <laughs> Keep going. Go quick. Come on. You're almost there. Oh, this is harder than I thought. It usually doesn't take so many questions. <laughs> you guys are overthinking it. Yeah. Did you say everybody has used it? Yeah, you've used this before. Everybody. Yeah, something like it. Equivalent of it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not used for sports. <laughs> Wait, but is it like, can you, is it meant for sports or is it something that you can like, that's two questions. Two questions. Is it meant for sports? sports? Make that a yes or no question. Is it a sports equipment? <laughs> yes. General though. That's just, it's kind of a stretch. No. No. Is it white? No. <laughs> it has round components. Is it a calculator? Yes, it's used in multiple sports. Is it a camera? No. Is it a stopwatch? No. Is it a calculator? No. This is fun. I didn't think this would take so many minutes. Is it a tennis racket? No. Is it a tennis racket? No. Is it a tennis racket? No. Is it a broccoli? I mean, come on. I can't tell you because you don't mind me. It's not. It's not. This isn't even the hardest one I took a picture of. Yeah. It has round stuff. Yeah. Is it soft? No, it's not soft. Is it something What's that? No shoe. It has like rounded edges and stuff. I wouldn't say it's round. Is it a wiffle ball? It's not a wiffle ball. Does it have electrical components? What? No. 
Does it glow? No. Does it have electrical components? Is it something you No, no electrical components. What? Is it something you hit? You hit, no. Is it something you wear? No. Does it cost under ten dollars? Yes. <laughs> That that oh, narrows it down. What, what is does it cost under, what is it, it would last a very long time. Does it cost under two dollars? Could it could easily, yeah. Okay. What about one ninety five? Just kidding. Yeah, there's stores that would sell things. <laughs> there are stores that sell things like this that you could easily get this for ninety nine cents if you look at the right stores. Oh, is it? No, it doesn't make it sound. No, it's not tape. No, not a mouth guard. The sports is kind of a stretch, right? You use it with sports. It's not sports. Is it spray tape? No. Do you use it for football? You could. Do you use it at home? You could. It's not sunscreen. So easy. You're all gonna go. Back. It's yes. What? What was the last question? Is it a container? Someone said, "Is it a container?" Yes. It's a water bottle. You said we can't put it in our pockets. I said you can't fit it in those pockets. You can't fit that in your pockets. A lot of people nowadays can fit in their pockets. That was actually a lot of questions. I'm surprised. I'm surprised we needed so many questions. Maybe at the end we'll, we'll do another one. Let's see if I can switch this back now. <laughs> So we're trying randomly, you know, to figure out what the content is. This is what your brain is trying to do all the time. You have some sort of input, and you're trying to figure out what is it, right? And your brain doesn't want to sort of do all of this work. It wants to do ask as few questions about the world as it can and try to make sense of that. So as we heard about this morning, you know, what do we do when we don't have enough labels? We don't have enough labels, right? So it used to be that this was like a big deal in storage, right? You had a data center like this. It's like, who's going to go through all the data? Right now, this is kind of a joke. Everybody carries one of these in their pocket right now. In 2007, we crossed a threshold where if you took all the hard drives on the planet, even if you had if you had every hard drive on the planet, you would still not be able to store all the information that's being created. We need a net, not a bucket. We're not going to be able to just put everything into a bucket and look at it later. We have to have a fishing net. The ocean is going to have to go through the net, so we're going to want to leave the fish in their net. So this is this big deal, right? We're not going to have enough labels. We're not going to be able to go through all this data. And you can see, this is seven years ago. Right? How has that progressed till now? What's is that? It, is it, has it continued to stay on oh, this yeah. path? Yeah. And why is that? Well, because you all have 10 megapixel phones. You can all take HD video right now if you wanted to. So we have this explosion of sensors that, that you can record all this information, but you don't have enough I just want to see the, you know, the growth of cloud storage and all this, making money, they're charging for you to have some of that. that slice. So the two main uh, areas of, of this learning is supervised learning, where we have labels. We know that these are the X's and these are the O's, and we want to figure out the slice and give it a new one. We can try to figure out which class does this data point belong to. When we don't have that, the best we can do is try to make clusters. If I were to hand you a pile of Legos and dump them on the floor, you could organize them by color and shape and size and Maybe what theme they go with. All the pirate Legos will go over here. All the space Legos go over there. But that's what we want to build. We want to build like a metric on something such that we can have, you know, apples and oranges and, and tomatoes are over here. And, you know, something like, air, you know, airplanes and spaceships are over here. Right? How do we want something that it knows how far apart things are, right? I want lemon to be near lime next to orange. You know, pineapple's pretty close, farther away from aardvark. How do we build like a, a, a map, a clustering, all that? How do we do that for words or for other things? So when we first get our data, we're not going to have colors. We're not going to have labels. We're just going to get a bunch of dots. And some of these dots, some of these people will have Alzheimer's. Some of these people will be normal. Some of these people will have Lewy body dementia. And you want to figure out, okay, how do, who goes where? You know, what treatment should we put people on? What category uh, should we apply for, for to put medicine? So we're just going to get a pile of this kind of stuff. We want to pass it through some kind of machine learning system and then break this down into different clusters. So we're not we're not giving it the labels. We don't tell it, you know, what clusters to look for, and it can do this automatically. So we want to give a bunch of data, and if it say, "Oh, I see a pattern," we can start sorting these things out. Anybody tell what that is? House. No, no, no. no observations. Water bottle. <laughs> so. Is it noise? It's a house. It's a lot of noise. Noise. Who can see the house? Maybe a barn with a chimney. So your brain is doing something called in-painting. 
you're trying to fill in those pixels. And this is really kind of what your, your retina is getting, is a sort of very noisy image. What you can do with this unsupervised, without providing any supervision to the algorithm, you can take this and turn it into that. Right? That'll be hard. That's hard to do. What's this one? Building New York. Maybe a cathedral? Mansion. Kind of building, mansion, cathedral type, type thing. Chinese. Yeah, it's a dorm So with unsupervised learning, with the dictionary learning and the sparse coding that we heard about this morning, we can take something like this, and this is the only input to the system. It's just this image itself. It'll create that. All right, so this is like the stuff in the movies where they go, enhance, yeah. enhance, right? And you sort of zoom in the stuff, right? Like in the, the crazy TV movies. But that's what we're kind of getting at. So what if we have something like this where we want to get rid of the text, right? It's easy. We go hire an artist, and then they can repaint the horse bits underneath the letter, right? <laughs> this thing doesn't know anything about horses. It doesn't have any sort of model of, you know, streets and horse and stuff like that to know. And it automatically was able to remove that text. We can see kind of zoomed in. This has no model of seagull. Like you didn't like give it like this is what seagulls are supposed to look like. Uh, it's just that it tried to build a dictionary of the natural world. And things that don't happen very. There's not really bright many bright bright red edges in the natural world, right? So why fire trucks are are, are painted the way they are because your your brain just kind of goes, what is this big red thing moving along? Um, I was actually watching uh, something on Amazon. And I noticed the characters with red shirts were fuzzier. So that means that Amazon has this dynamic compression algorithm. And it thinks that red is not very common, so it doesn't bother, you know, it doesn't have as good an algorithm for that. And so the red, the people wearing red shirts were blurrier than the people wearing not red. And so somehow their compression has prioritized not red stuff because it just happens more often. Yeah. The, that example of the, the big building with the water. Yeah. The, so are there no, there's no priors that tell it to identify water or reflection or specular reflection? No. Nope. No, no prior of house, no prior of even so, outside. What it's going to try to do what, is build a dictionary. What guides it in generating the reflect the reflection of the house in the water, for example? It's it's that there's right. This this is twenty question ideas. It took us almost like yeah. hundred questions to get to it, but it wasn't the millions of pixels. So somehow the castleness or whatever this is is still in here. Yeah. And that if we kind of complete this with the dictionaries, as we're going to see, that we can kind of say what's the closest little patch. So we saw the dictionary patches. We want to say what's the closest little patch that would be consistent with what we have. And now replace that with that full yeah. these gabors that we've been seeing. And so if we replace that with sort of the best dictionary element that fits that observation, it'll, it'll fill it in for us. And so we think this is pretty much what our brain has to be doing basically all the time. So we want to represent the most visual information with the fewest resources, right? Like if we wasted calories, evolution would have knocked us out a long time ago. We have to be very careful how our calories are spent. Our brain uses something like a third of our calories or something outrageous, right? And so we don't want to just spend time paying attention to parts that don't matter, right? And so we think of vision where we think it's all about, you know, this is what we can see. It's really the magic is all the stuff we can ignore, right? Like this second tile in over here. Like who noticed this tile this morning and paying attention to it? Like why would you? You know about ceiling tiles. It fits into understanding. You know about drop ceilings. You've seen this before. It's just like that one and that one and that one and that one. There's nothing special about it. Your brain paid no attention to it. How does it know not to pay any attention to it? Right? You're here to learn all kinds of stuff. How do you know the information's not up there in that ceiling tile? Of course you know it's not there. Your brain has this model of like what to pay attention to, so not waste uh, energy. We'll come back to that one. So you want to you know, represent this stuff as, as, as you know, efficient as possible. So this goes back quite a bit. Then we want to figure out, you know, we can see these models over the years, over the decades, trying to figure out, all right, what is this brain is actually doing? We saw this yesterday with the, the visual statistics, that as we go in higher and higher spatial frequencies, Right, you can imagine like the, the blinds here are good. It's a good spatial frequency, right? And as these things got closer and closer together, well, in the limit, you're going to be like at the size of atoms. So that's how you know this has to go down to zero. As the, as the ripples get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer together, like they can't be, they can't exist physically. So they're going to have to kind of disappear. So this is a good way of remembering that the high spatial frequencies kind of disappear because uh, you couldn't have them in the limit. They wouldn't exist. So these are the boards. These are these sort of template dictionary shapes that our brain is trying to build so that we can fill in pictures like that. That when we see just some little speckles, we can say, well, there was a, there was a bright spot here and a dark spot here, so maybe it was one of these kind of things, and then we can fill out the rest of that shape. So this is what they look like if you plot them mathematically, and then this is what they look like if you, you know, measure in the real cortex, right? And so this is the visual cortex of a cat, and they go through and, and map this out with electrophysiology, 
and you get basically the same thing. So this is an argument that our brain is doing this sort of wavelet decomposition. So we want to take a, a full image, which has lots and lots of pixels, and instead have you know, maybe 100 specialists that are telling us something about this image. And they're reporting, say, I found an edge at this angle, or I found a blob of red over here. And they can send that up to the next layer, because this can help you make a decision. right? So if you see one of these blobs, and this one's big saber teeth, and this one's like angry, and you know, it's like run that way, right? So you want to break down the scene. We don't have to consider the whole image. You have to know which way to, to run. And that's the decision that our brain is trying to reduce all of this stuff to. Typically with computer codes, we have something called ASCII. So if you're familiar with, with how we encode binary on the computer, um, what you can do is you can sort of count in binary, and you get this dense code, and you get a lot of of possibilities, right? You get two to the n for the number of neurons. So you can represent a whole lot of different patterns. But it's really difficult to read out because each pattern doesn't really mean anything, right? They're sort of in just like a random sequence. It happens to be binary. But it's hard to tell. There's no meaning in each pattern, right? You have to have a lookup table. The other thing we were looking at is this idea of this grandmother cell, that you have one neuron that fires when you see something like your grandmother, right? So this would be the end, the, the opposite extreme. And this is Fine for when we're building deep learning systems. We can say that we have one little cell at the end, like the two that blinks, and when we have that big red two at the other end of the network, it was blinking the two neuron to tell us that's what the digit. In between, we have this idea of a sparse code, where we're going to have some of these things turned on. And so we're not going to get quite as many patterns as the binary, but we're going to get way more possible patterns than just having one. So if we just have one turned on, then we can only represent n things, one for each person. So you'd only be able to represent so many people. But these, we can do this where we're taking combinations. We're going to turn a few of these on. There's something in mathematics called the choose function, which tells you the number of things when you have so many and you want to choose a smaller number to be turned on. And that actually is a really, really large number. So we get a lot, a lot of possible combinations out of this sparse code. You can see this is kind of. Not like what computers code, and not quite like the early days of neuroscience. It's just sort of a, a new way of thinking of these codes. And it's very powerful. So we want to take something like a video and break it down into like a sweeping edge. So we've been looking at just pictures, and we saw those features of like angles, but that might be animated, right? We'll see those later as they, as they watch video. You can also apply them to color or depth images, uh, different kinds of cameras, RGB. Um, as well as like infrared depth sensors, laser finders, all that kind of stuff. Part of the problem with this field, don't worry about the details here, but part of the problem with this stuff is that things have been reinvented over and over again and giving a different name. So we talked about the idea of, 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 of whitening images. Well, that's what this LGN does, right? And so we could think in mathematically, oh, that's the autocorrelation function. So as you're going through this stuff and you're trying to learn it, you know, don't be intimidated and, and remember, keep in the back of your mind that often something you, you already understand you're encountering some, again, but just has a different name. And so these different things you're going to find, they have very different names depending on sort of which field you're approaching this subject, from computer science, from mathematics, or from neurobiology. So just keep that in the back of your mind, that a lot of this stuff you know, has the same different names. We want to think of images as functions, right? That we want to kind of zoom in, and we can think of this as like a mathematical function, that if we go to each possible spot in, the, in the, the, the rows and the columns, there's going to be a number there. So in like an analog photograph, we're going to have a, a continuous version. But when we take a digital photograph, it's just going to be little squares. So we want to think about how do we break apart images? You know, it wasn't that long ago that you couldn't have things like uh, video or even music on a computer. When I was growing up, you couldn't even fit a single CD of music on your hard drive. It would just wipe out your whole hard drive with just a few songs. It wasn't until MP3 came along where we figured out how to compress these signals um, that you could actually transmit and, and store these things in a reasonable way. So one way we could describe the signals, these pictures, I could have just told you the brightness, right, with the water bottle. I could have just told you the first pixel has brightness so, and the second pixel has this brightness. And we'd go through the whole thing, and if I tell you the brightness of each one and you wrote them all down, you could plot it and you'd have your picture. But that's kind of an expensive way to communicate the image. If Netflix had to Morse code you or email you every single little dot, they'd spend a lot more money on the internet than they do now. So we could just sort of tell you which pixels are turned on. Instead, what we want to do is we want to do something in the Fourier basis. We want to build a, a don't worry about the details, this stuff you can just look up later when you get the slides. Um, but we want to build this thing out of waves. We want to take an image and think of it as a superposition of a bunch of different waves. 
And so we're going to take a picture like this, and there's a, a theorem in mathematics that says we can take this and we can break it up into a, an addition of images that look like this. We take a little bit of this one and add to it a little bit of that one and add some of this one. And if we keep doing this, we'd have to add lots and lots and lots of them so that we would get back to this picture. So in this case, now I want to email you something. I just have to tell you, I want to send you this picture. I just have to tell you how much of each of these in this recipe to add together, and then you're going to get back the original photograph. And I didn't have to send you every pixel. It's, it's, it's like adding the frequency component. Okay. Yeah, they're just going to add them together. Or you save it. Yeah, so imagine like in the old days of projection, right, we would have, you know, slide transparencies. You could take two slide transparencies and you sort of overlay them, and then you'd have your image. You're going to take one like this, you take one like this, and you're just going to stack them. And imagine these are sort of transparent, and you get superposition. So if we look uh, in this idea of K-space, that we can have all possible you know, versions of these stripey things, and the, we'll have to choose a lot of these. And so in a real image, when you break things down into this, it works, and it works great. But you're going to have to require a lot of these components to build up a, a scene. It won't be sparse. It'll be dense. So here we can do just that. We can take a picture here. We can zoom in on like a little piece of this picture here. And then we can actually break it up into these little pieces. Right, so we have one that's blank, one that has bright to dark, another one that up top. This one's going to go bright, dark, bright. This one's sort of dark, bright, dark, and so on. And so you have all of these different patterns. These are like the edge detectors, but they're almost a little bit too neat and perfect, right? They're sort of too organized. It's sort of the mathy version of things rather than the biological version. So we can take this image. Here's the original. We can break it down into a bunch of these by multiplying it by this sort of funny matrix here, which is really just these things rearranged. And then that will give us another reconstruction of this. So this is the fake. This is the counterfeit version that's made out of, out of these things. So when, you, when I took that picture or you text somebody the photograph, I, if I send you that green water bottle, you're not actually going to get the green water bottle photo. Your phone's not going to bother to send that. It's too expensive. So what it's going to do is it's going to transmit these over text, and then your phone's going to reconstruct it, adding them back up together, and then you can see the water bottle. So we can imagine this with sort of like some funny characters that what we want to do is we want to take a new image and then we want to build it out of these features. And these are what we want to find unsupervised. We don't know what these features are in the beginning, right? We could, we could just load up these features and that works. But what the improvement of deep learning has been to let the computer decide what these features are going to be. And then when you get a new image, you're going to build this and you say we take 0.999 of that one. 0.97 of this one, 0.82 of this one, and we're going to add them all up together, and that's going to give us our new image. And so in this case, I didn't have to tell you how many pixels. I didn't have to specify each of these pixels. I just told you three numbers. Right? So it's just Morse code, you three numbers. It's much cheaper. So we're trying to take the external world, and we're trying to build a model of it that's much simpler. Right? This neuron is going to tell us there's an angle at this edge, and this one's going to tell us there's a blue thing over here, and this one's telling there's a bit of yellow in the top left. And then from this output, this is describing the image, right? It's telling you something about the scene. And then there might be some error, right? It might not represent it perfectly, but we could kind of throw that away. And what's nice is we can use this to get rid of noise in a picture. So we can build a system like this and we think, well, most real pictures can be written as a combination of these features. And then everything else, this other stuff, let's throw it away. And that will do something called denoising. That will actually take the noise out of our image. So here's another view of those Gabors. Here's a schematic, and here's an actual cell that's been mapped up. Uh, so we can see that there's strong evidence to believe that the brain is doing something you know, very similar to this. So here's another version of that same thing. So imagine I'm Netflix. You are going to watch the, uh, the series premiere or something that just came out. And so they have to Morse code. You have to email over the internet all of, these, all of this data. One way they can do it is just send every single value here, 256 numbers or so. Netflix is like 40% of the internet or something outrageous. So, you know, their internet bill is, is, is crazy. If they can send you less data, they're going to want to do it. So instead, what you do is you can download this one time onto your computer. You know, put this in the set-top box or the browser one time, let's say. And then if you're Netflix, all you have to do is just specify which of these you're going to add together to get your new little section of the film. And so we're just going to take 0.8 of this one, 0.3 of that one, 0.5 of this one. Or just instead, if we have, there's 64 here, so we just send a, a string of 64 numbers. We say that one's turned on, that one's turned on, and that one's turned on. Or we just say six numbers. We say 0.8 times number 36, 
0.3 times number 42 and 0.5 times number 63. And everyone will have the same number 63. And so we can build back up that scene. So you can imagine how this would be a lot more efficient to, to send things across the internet. We think this is a lot more efficient to send ideas across your brain. Your brain has to break the world down. It doesn't want to spend calories understanding the world. It has to sort of break it down into things that are important. Oh, there's an edge here. Oh, there's a cyber tooth here. You know, there's something that I need to run. So this is, you could do the same thing with audio. This doesn't just apply to vision. So here we see uh, in red, gabors, those same shapes, but in one dimension, right? Just one plot rather than two dimensions. And then in blue superimposed, we see the recording from, the, from a cat. They can actually put like a little, um, a glass bead on the ear of a cat and shoot a laser at it and present sounds. You can actually see the dynamic of, of these, uh, of the ear. And so you can see that the, the sort of the brain is sort of sparse coding uh, in audio as well. So here's some, um, an initial dictionary that we made and this starts completely random, but I gave it natural forest sounds. Like go out and listen to the forest. And this is what it comes up with. I think it's neat, it looks rather biological to me. It was like a, you look under like a microscope at pond water, you seems like you get stuff like this. Uh, and you can see it's sort of these features spread out, right? This would be like a, like a steady tone. This would be like, you know, like blips. And so these are like cricket noises. These are the birds whistling. And, you know, crickets have to ignore the birds. The birds have to ignore the crickets. Well, unless they're trying to eat, you know, eat them or something. But in general, you know, think they have to like, imagine all the television channels are on one channel at once, you know, all the TV, right? We don't do that. We, you know, we put the news on at five and the football game comes on at six and then there'll be a movie at eight, right? We can't, we imagine doing them all at the same time. That's what the forest is doing. The birds are and the crickets are going and the other ones are going right? all at the same time. And so they have to figure out how do you separate all that stuff out? And so this is how their brain, the one theory of their brains could be doing is that each one could sort of tune in for their own specific thing. And then the noise, the forest would be relatively quiet for them. We can do this in color. Um, the idea behind this was that the birds have to figure out what butterflies to eat. There's some butterflies you can eat and some butterflies you don't want to eat. And the bird somehow in his bird brain has to figure that out, either on an evolutionary scale or on a learning scale. And so this, we took different species of butterfly. And when you expose the learning algorithm to different types of butterflies, you get very different patterns out here. You see this one was a monarch butterfly. So we're trying to build these, these dictionaries. The first layer of dictionary is going to be very simple edges, colored blobs. And then from that, we want to look at like eyes here are made out of a combination of edges. So here's like a little eye type region. It's not actually an eye, but I can see an eye there. I can see who sees a nose there. Right? You may see that as a nose. You see this as an eye. That's sort of an eye. Right? And so these things, right, there's like an eyebrow. And so it's trying to build up clusters. And then from that, you say, oh, faces are made out of these. Right? And so some of these you can recycle. So some of these pieces are also good at representing airplanes and cars. And motorcycles. And motorcycles. Right? And edges are used for all of them. So this is really important because we want to do something like transfer learning. I could show you something you've never seen before, uh, like these little weird speaker pods that you can put out there so you guys can talk. You've never seen that thing before, right? I doubt. But you can know what it is in just one go. If I ask you tomorrow, what's that thing? You'd be like, well, it's the speaker pod thing. You told us about it yesterday. Right? The machine learning doesn't work that way. You cannot just show it one dog and say, this is what dogs, this is a doggy, right? If you have a little toddler and you introduce them to one cat and they get to like pet that cat and interact with it, they're not really going to forget cats. Right? They're going to know cats. And so that's probably the fact that humans are much richer experience as multi-sensory. They're touching the cat. They're petting the cat. They're moving around the world. They're looking at the cat, listening to it. So that's what we want to move towards so that we can get things where we can do one-shot learning. I can show you this segue. You've never seen a particular version of that. Uh, and so you could, you could know what this is. And so we wanted to be able to do transfer learning where you can go out into the web and you maybe take some of this data, maybe figure out the dictionaries, maybe figure out the shapes of the world without labels, and then use those to, to load into something like the Flower 17, where you want to recognize something specific. So what's really awesome about this is you can do really low power with some of these ideas, um, these neuromimetic processors. You can see they want to put these in little hand launched kind of things. Um, and so this is kind of some meat and potatoes kind of thing. So don't, <laughs> it's not bad, right? It's just a bunch, it just looks like a bunch of mess. And what's crazy is like, you remember when you learned how to read, right? What did you do? Well, you held the book upside down and you held it backwards and you just turned the pages. You have to be comfortable with doing that kind of stuff with mathematics, right? Just jump into it and don't be afraid of like, oh, what is, what is it, right? Gloss over parts of it and your brain will start to, to chew on things as it can, right? But let's just kind of, you know, maybe concentrate on these pieces up here. Don't worry about all the details, but what this is gonna say is I have some image Y that I'm trying to predict. 
in the world. And I want to build that out of a combination of these dictionary elements. So we're going to have a recipe that tells us which dictionary elements to actually include, like that we had uh, here. So we're trying to sort of build a recipe of this thing, that I want this thing, the Y, to be equal to some combination of other stuff. So we can do this addition as a sort of a funny, uh, as a matrix multiplication. So if you're, if, you're not worried, if you're not familiar with this stuff, don't worry about it too much. But what this is saying is this is going to be the recipe, and this is going to be the dictionary of possible choices of those uh, elements that we're going to superimpose, right? Our dictionary, our code book. So this is telling us which elements of the code book we're going to recruit into our reconstruction of our input. Why? We want that difference to be as small as possible. If that difference is zero, then that means you have a perfect reconstruction of your input. So we want the y to be equal to this sort of reconstruction. And then this squares and half and stuff. Don't worry about that bit, right? And then this other term here, we're going to do an addition. So we need that term as one, which is going to tell us how accurately we've reproduced our image. If this goes to zero, then we're great. Then we want to add to that another term. We're building a loss function. We're building a loss function that we want to later optimize. So we have to penalize it for both its reconstruction ability, but we also want to look at this term, which is this is a fun, fancy way of just saying add up the absolute values. Just add, add everything up. Pretend like it's a bar graph and you're just going to add them up. That's telling you how many, that's a way of counting how many of these got recruited in your reconstruction. So we notice here only three actually got recruited. That's good. That's what we want. That's sparse in that most of these are zero. We didn't use any of the first one. We didn't use any of the second one. We didn't use any of that one. We didn't use any of the last one. We only used, had to use three. That's this idea of sparsity. And so that absolute value, you want to add up this number here, this whole row, right? Think of this as like a row in Excel, and it's telling you how much of these you're going to be using. We're just going to take the absolute value and add it all up. What's that? Yeah, it's just telling us how many of these that we use. It's a way of counting. And so it's just a fancy way of counting how many dictionaries they would recruit in our reconstruction and how accurate is our reconstruction. So amazingly, this is something we can plug right into TensorFlow. We'll send this code with you home. You know, at the end of the week, you have this, you can try it next week. And then you can run this in TensorFlow and it will learn one of these dictionaries for you automatically. So that if you set up this loss function, you say, I want to minimize, I want you to change X such that you minimize this whole thing. Forget lambda. We can just pretend like that's a one. Forget the half. We just want to measure that difference is really small and that the number of actual things recruited in this reconstruction is small. Don't let it use too many pieces. So these are going to be start showing up. Um, you know, hopefully down the line we can see some you know, glasses that can actually help you know, the blind walk around. We're working with some students on campus for this kind of thing. And so silicon retinas, uh, silicon vision are, are not that far away. Uh, there's, there's technologies now where you can plug these things right into the back of your cortex and these people kind of learn how to see. Um, if you're familiar with the cochlear implant, you know, this thing plugs into your brain, right? This thing's like the matrix. It's not a hearing aid, right? It's not an amplifier. It doesn't make it louder. It takes it and turns it into brain signals and it plugs it right into your brain. So hopefully we can build these kinds of systems uh, that can interact and, and add these vision signals right to people's brains. So here we go back to the butterflies. We can train them on different butterflies and we get very different, uh, different codes. Here's that same equation again. Um, and then we get pictures like this. So this one is just on simple images. Black and white is a false coloring. The yellow and blue aren't real. It's really a black and white image. But it just kind of helps it to stand out a bit. So you can see these edges. And it sort of spreads out. It decides what each one is going to represent. They're sort of fighting and evolving, you know, competing for a representation in this thing. They don't want to do the same thing as their neighbors. Here we can kind of see it uh, in grayscale. And then you can see there's almost like a swirly kind of pattern where these things are sort of there's a continuity to stuff. Uh, this is something we actually see in the visual cortex. That when you go back and you look at the brain, and you look at the brain cells, and you look and you find one that looks for uh, dark, bright, dark, the brain region right next to that is going to be looking for something very similar. So there's a sort of continuity of these features across our brain, which is very exciting. Um, so this was something that was found years ago in the physiology. It is now just starting to show up again in this mathematical world. So it's really neat that you have this thing. It's like, well, this thing kind of walks like a duck, right? We've got a brain that's duck-like, and we've got this thing that's kind of like a duck. And it's like, well, maybe this thing is, is kind of brain-like. In other words, the brain is looking for a certain amount of redundancy. Yes, it's looking for redundancy, so it doesn't repeat itself. Um, this is called the zebra butterfly. Right? As you see, it found zebra-like stripes. 
And so I'm not sure if zebra butterflies are poisonous or not, but this would give you a neuron that would fire and maybe you, you know, flap towards it or flap away from it, uh, knowing that you could eat it or not eat it. And this will be a very different kind of butterfly. Uh, this is a monarch butterfly. As you can see, you get very, very different um, admiral, swallowtail, zebra. You get these different kinds of patterns. And then can we use these to classify butterflies? We get a new butterfly, we want to know what, where, where to classify it. Right? So the exciting thing is that, you know, it wasn't that long ago you had to use a computer like this. Right? So this is the uh, differential analyzer at UCLA. The 40s. Numbers here were represented by moving things. Right? Not even so much like the clock. Like the clock is telling you like where stuff is that had that too, but also had like how fast these things were spinning around. And you could use these to solve these kinds of equations. But now we can do this stuff at just basically light speed on the computer, and they sort of can solve this kind of thing. So uh, we had the opportunity to have Garrett Kenyon come visit the lab a few years ago. He works at Los Alamos National Labs, and they run this type of math on the D-Wave quantum computer and one of the fastest supercomputers in the world out there. Uh, and I got to talk with him uh, in Portland just a few months ago when I was out at Intel. And he was saying that this captures a good chunk of the computer vision in theoretical neuroscience, right? This, this one little equation. So it looks kind of like a mess at first, but it's really just C spot run, right? But when you first, you know, learned how to read, it was like, I don't, I don't know, this is about a cat. You didn't even know what the story is about. So just don't be intimidated by stuff like this. Jump into it. So you can see here, we're going to take some patches, and then we're going to have an approximation of that patch. So here it is as an image, but there it is as sort of like a mountain range. You can plot this in 3D. And you can see how close are these things to the actual image, right? So you can see there's an original, and there's an approximation. You can look at the, the difference is very small. And if we look at there's a zero, and so these are very small. It's very easily able to reproduce these things. And so you can use this as a compression algorithm, but we can also use it as sort of an understanding algorithm. We want to know where our edges. We need to report that forward. We can do this for video. Uh, so it's really cool. We take video, and you can take the frame differences. So you just subtract one frame from the next. And you get sort of this, this edge. And so it's telling you where the pixels changed. And so these pixels show up, and those pixels kind of disappeared. Uh, and it gives you a, a nice outline. And so if you want to analyze human behavior, it's often much simpler to look at a picture like this. So what we can do is we can take those images from different classes, say like walking, running, jogging. Um, and then we can uh, break them up into the different categories, and then take little, little chunks from each image. Right? It's kind of like a convolution. We can take little cookie cutter patches out of each image. And then we can sort of separate those little patches into training and testing. So we'll hide some of these for later. And then what we can do is we can take these and we can just stretch them out like vectors. Seems almost like too strong a thing to do, but it works. You can take your image and really just write it as a list. We wouldn't be able to see it as a picture anymore, but the math's okay. And then we can sort of have these lists of numbers that represent the different patches. So this might be the monarch butterfly. This would be the zebra butterfly. Or this might be someone walking. This might be someone running. This might be uh, you know, healthy x-ray. This might be a... Uh, unhealthy x-ray. So then what we want to do is we want to learn a dictionary of these things, and then we can put them all together. We can say, take these elements from the monarch and the zebra butterfly and the other one, and then put them all together. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do a school math equation. We're going to do our sparse coding. We're going to take a new patch, and we want to build it out of this thing. So this is a funny sort of way of representing matrix multiplication. So I've, I've emphasized the fact that these are, are, are sort of vertical columns of numbers. And if you're familiar with matrix multiplication, what you're going to do is you're going to peel off the first number here, multiply it by that number, peel off the second number, multiply it by the second number here, peel off the third number, multiply it by that one, and so on. And that's going to give you some reconstruction. This is just a graphical way of representing the thing we were talking about with the Netflix with the gray squares that get added together, right? This is a different way of, this is how you mathematically represent it, which is kind of, kind of cool. And so this is neat because they're building chips that can do this operation where you have one matrix and you have one vector. They're building special machines that can do just this task, so it'll go really fast. So we take our frames, right? We break it up into like little sugar cubes. This is like a film, and so we're gonna have like a little small animated GIF, and then we want to know is that what is this? Is this someone? Did someone just fall down, right? So in the hospital, if you have a hospital of about a thousand beds, you get about two falls every day. This sort of doubles the time people have to stay in the hospital. Obviously, they're hurt. Uh, it's terrible, right? Risk of infection because they stay in the hospital longer. So we want to know, this is some little video clip from the camera. It's looking at somebody in a hospital room. Did they just fall down? So what we can do is we could stack up a bunch of example videos of people not falling down, you know, maybe people eating their lunch, and then maybe some people falling down, right? And so what you then want to do is you want to say, which class does this belong to? I want to know, is this which category? And so we'll try to build this out of the things we've seen before. So we're reconstructing something new, and we're going to build it out of our previous memories. And then we say, which of our memories did we recruit the most? 
And so here we used one red, uh, one green, and three blue to build that construction. And so we'd say, well, since you used three blue pieces, it's probably a blue thing. And so then we can label this as blue. And so this is a cool way with sparse modeling to do classification. So it's called a sparse sparsity-based classifier. So that we're going to take our new image that we don't know what it is, and we're trying to represent it out of things we've seen before. So you can imagine these are sort of like memories that you have, and you're going to try to build this out of that. And then you look at which ones got recruited the most. If you used three blues and only one of the, each of the other, then we can assign this to a category. We can do this to classify textures. If we take images like this, uh, we get lots of different image categories on that. So you can see it's hard to see because they're really small. But each texture right, gives you a very different dictionary. And so if we want to understand, right, like animals have to know what they can burrow in and where they should make a home and stuff like that. So they're constantly looking at all the textures of the world. Like a woodpecker has to know what sort of trees have the certain things and what's going to have a grub underneath that. So their sort of brain has to take the world apart like this. And so the idea is that it can build these dictionaries, maybe genetically over evolutionary time scale or in learning, like especially with mammals, that these are going to be you know, wired up into your cortex as you learn. So as we see these again, we can have the, the different thing. Uh, so one of the interesting things we've been doing in our research is trying to build a new model of this. Uh, so a few years ago, we were watching a talk, and they were saying that there was a third order power law to describe this. And so we were like, hey, there's this cool thing. We can add that. So we take this equation just for x cubed. You're just taking a number and you're cubing it, right? pretty straightforward. And then we can use that uh, to build this system out of. So this is just kind of fun stuff. You can, we'll send you some more of this later. But uh, that we, could, we were able to, to change this out and add in the smooth function before the previous algorithm used this uh, harsh blue function that the original author said they just made up for no particular reason. We know, for instance, that red, that neurons happen to do this red curve. And so we added some more evidence, made this thing more biological, essentially, and it, and it works really well. And so there's just more reason to believe that, this, that the brain might be doing something like this, because we know the brain can do the red curve, and the blue curve works really well for doing this kind of thing. So that's what we can run. We get a very simple equation. Some of the stuff that just kind of crazy is like, this is three lines of code that makes this dictionary, right? Microsoft Word is like a, Microsoft Office is like a hundred million lines of code. hundred million, something like that. Outrageous, you know, with Windows, it's twice as much. What does that do, right? What does Windows really do for you, right? Or what, is, or what does Microsoft Word really do that you need a hundred million lines of code in complexity? It's just a bloated mess. There are bugs in the Microsoft source code that have to do with justification and where the cursor goes. The bugs have been reported about 50,000 times over the last 30 years. They can't find it. They have no idea where it is. They lost the original source code and had to decompile it one time. So I think it's really exciting to think about like how we can rethink some of this stuff. And some of these very powerful systems are, are just trivial in terms of how much code is in it. So these are just more of these kind of things. So we want these things to not just organize, but this way we want them to kind of cluster, right? We want all of these of the same type to organize on, on multiple scales. And this is all completely unsupervised. We didn't tell it to put these over here and these over here and these over here. You can just sort of get them to fight for territory and they will end up organizing themselves this way. And then if we add sort of a smooth, this puts them into, forces them into little cookie cutter blocks. And right? you can kind of see the block size. But instead, if we move and slide the, the block around, then we get this sort of smooth version. And so this is something similar that we see in biology. And so this is kind of neat. When you, when you run this on color images, it decided to organize all the green stuff over here and all the magenta stuff over here. Um, and you can see there's sort of like, you know, dog and cat-like objects over here. There's like some horse-like objects over here. Um, and it sort of organized these automatically. We didn't tell it even the labels. We just give it all the data, and it sort of builds this uh, to try to organize these. And so philosophers, they've been talking for hundreds of years about the redness of red. What do we mean when we see something red? Well, it could be that this general region is firing and reporting red in a non-specific way. So it's just really neat to see how it organizes. These are sort of like minivan type features up here, right? Uh, here's like bird type objects. So this is the CIFAR 10 data set, which has like cats, dogs, birds, houses, cars, stuff like that. Uh, and it sort of automatically organized these. So this is sort of the, 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 the exciting area is this unsupervised um, Learning. I meant to put the, the slide in here, but Jan McCoon has a cool metaphor where he has a, a cake and a cake with icing in the cherry. And he says that supervised learning is the is the icing. The cake is the unsupervised learning. If this is really like gonna be the really important part moving forward with the field, is the unsupervised. And reinforcement learning is the cherry on top. And so 
We'll try to find that picture from where we put it up there tomorrow. But I just think this is really neat how it automatically, we didn't tell it to organize the red stuff. We didn't tell it to make a green region. It did that completely unsupervised. I have a quick question. Yeah. Does it uh, have the ability also to make regions like this about things it's never seen before, inferred from things it has seen before? So like it's building up these based on observations, say from like a, a video image or something, <clears throat> uh, and then a, across a small set of, of classifications of dogs, cats, those are small representations of the real world, and there seems to be a lot of correlation of the, these have similar features. Can it then correlate other things to predict what it should expect for future things rather than just waiting until it sees them and then start building new models? Yeah, it's, it's a really great question. You know, one of the things that we're interested in doing with this is to look at like curiosity and boredom. You know, we mentioned earlier in the week that with our little rover cars, one of the exciting things that we would have happen is if we go in one morning, unlock the door, and open up, and the rover just scoots out. <laughs> just because it's terribly bored with the with the inside of that room, and it's just you know desperate to see what else is in the hall. Everyone else gets to go in the hallway. I might never get to go in the hallway. Um, you know that would be awesome. And we don't want we could hand code that say, if it's been 15 minutes and you haven't seen anything, you know, then turn on boredom loop. No, we don't want that. We want to build a brain out of this thing. And one thing that we know brains do is they get bored. Uh, if we put like a puppy in that room and you close the door and leave it in there by itself, it might entertain for a few minutes chewing and destroying things. But then it's going to quickly get really upset, right? It's not going to want to be around itself. It's going to exhaust that room in terms of its exploration and curiosity. And it's going to be really, like, bored. It's going to be like, I don't want to be here. I want to be doing something new, right? right? How, do you, you know, like, how do you entertain you know, like, you know, kids and stuff like this? You know, they constantly are like, I'm bored, right? Because their brain is like, they need information. As much as people need food and water, you need information streams. This is why Netflix is so successful, right? Because people are like, oh, yeah, this is more data. It's your brain just kind of craves this, right? And so we think this is a really cool model. We want to put this into the to the rover car and then show it something it's never seen before and then have it not well represented, right? And so in that recruitment where we had the one gray square where we tried to build it out of those other three, say that we didn't, that we were able to easily build it out of just three, right? What if we had to recruit everything in there? That means we don't really know what this is. We're like throwing everything we have at it. We still can't understand it. And that might be something to go explore. It's something that's not easily understood in terms of things we've seen before which would tell us this might be interesting, it might be useful. Um, and so we can kind of do something like that. So we can do this in 3D, which is really cool. We did this for MRI images. And so you can put this in 3D and then try to organize uh, the volume. So each of these would be like a little sugar cube and you're trying to organize them that way. <laughs> so here's what you can do if you run them on, on video, right? You get animated your border. So on the brain, this is gonna be much more We've been sort of having a, a static picture of these, but really these things are going to be motion. They're going to be looking for objects. Like when you're, if you're listening, if you're looking at me while I talk, you might be using this information to disambiguate, maybe in the back, if I'm not loud enough, they're going to be sort of using movements of my mouth to try to figure out what, what I'm actually saying. Another thing that you can use that's unsupervised is sort of the smoothness of things. It's the idea of a total variation. And so this is a very powerful way of measuring things when you don't have too much signal or feedback about the world. And here we've, we have a neuron that's been trained to recognize if someone's looking left or looking right. And there was this whole thing about when neurons are black boxes, we don't know what they learn. Oh, nonsense. Tell me this thing is not looking for something going this versus something going like that. Right? We can very obviously interpret this receptive field. This is a neuron that's trying to decide if there's a face going this way or if there's a face going that way. We can see this one on, on the right here is a little smoother on, than the one on the left. And so this one has been regularized with this idea of total variation. So we can actually penalize the network and say, how noisy is this, right? You know, imagine this is like a, you know, you want to smooth this out, right? Uh, this is like a, a contract thing. You want to bring in the bulldozer and, and smooth out this landscape. And that's sort of extra feedback you can get when you don't have much other. So this is kind of a cool map. Uh, it's a lot to take in, but I just wanted to have this so you have it in your slides when you take it home. We can see here sparse modeling right here in the middle. Uh, this started with, uh, in 97, we actually, uh, David Field came down a few years ago. Um, and you can see there's other areas that we're interested in. We just mapped for research and compressed sensing, uh, this idea of different kinds of norms. We can see convolutional networks that we've been talking about, 89. We talked about the, the Neo Cognitron from Fukushima from 82. We also talked about the, the architecture of V1, these bores. And so we can see how this, this, this Nobel Prize of, of, of Hubel and Wiesel in 62 led to the work of the Neo Cognitron, Fukushima, which led to the work of, of convolutional network, which then splits off and goes other ways, but then that led to the object recognition now in 2010. And then we can use that, right? So like for, for the brain, we want to do something like connectomics. We want to take apart brain images. And we're working with the, uh, the Max Planck Neuroscience Institute now uh, to take apart and do small scale connectomics. They have some of the best microscopes in the world. And so they have a massive amount of data. Evan, you said it's like a 
terabyte every 30 minutes or something? Yep. Yeah. This is just outrageous, right? So imagine that. That's like you know going buying a laptop from the mall. By the time you get it home, it's full, right? Uh, <laughs> object recognition, um, speech recognition has, has been a big, big breakthrough. And so it's just neat to see how this whole sort of crazy stuff. And this is why it's a difficult field to jump in. I, but I encourage you to do so because there's not that much, right? There's not that much here, and you, it looks like a mess. But once you kind of make, make, make your way around, you can kind of find it. Um, yeah. So I think I'll, I'll just end with that for now. Any questions? Oh boy. How can I reconstruct a, uh, an image which I haven't seen ever? When you uh, haven't seen it ever? Let, let, let's take it away. Have, have you read that novel, uh, Strange in the Strange Land? No. Well, suppose I haven't seen a, a, a woman ever. Mm -hmm. So, in order to know. How would you, you, so, how do you know you're going to be able to see it? Uh, you might not be able to see it. This is in a scenario. You can't see it until you believe it, right? Everyone says you don't believe it until you okay. see it. Uh, you have to tell that you woman can't see it until you believe it. You have to tell that woman take off your clothes to check if you are a woman now. Right. So yeah, so you're gonna have some sort of you might get a, a measure. So how does our brain know to ignore that ceiling tile and pay attention to other things? And so the ceiling tile fits into the dictionary you have about what you know, but maybe some of the stuff we talked about in the slides doesn't fit into the dictionaries you have, and so it might have popped out as being a little more salient. So wow, this is brain science stuff. I don't, I'm not familiar with this kind of thing. For those in the back, I'll read this for those in the back. This is a Hawking quote from 88, and it says, A well-known scientist once gave a public lecture on astronomy, described how the Earth orbits the sun and how the sun in turn orbits around the center of a star and a galaxy. And at the end of the lecture, a little old lady in the back room got up and said, What you have told us is rubbish. The world is really a flat plate supported on the back of a giant tortoise. The scientist gave a smile and said, Well, what is the tortoise standing on? A very clever young man, very clever, but it's turtles all the way down. I love this quote because we don't know what's at the bottom of our brain, right? We don't know, like, what do you get to the edge of this kind of stuff? When you, when you really take apart some of this stuff, we're trying to figure out, like, what, is it, what do pictures look like? What does it mean to understand, a, recognize a cat or dog? What do words mean? Like, how is it that you're understanding? And I'm just changing the air pressure in the room. Take a big gulp of air, and I got this little thing. Blah, 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 blah. And it's going to change the air pressure right, many, many times a second. And somehow your brain is decoding all of this, and it's building this reality. What's at the bottom of this thing, right? We're saying it's neurons at the bottom. That's right? like turtles all the way down, right? Like what, what, what's at the thing? We don't know. We don't know. I think this is really exciting that we're sort of hitting the edge of, you know, this kind of stuff. Where we, we don't know how our brain works. We don't know what it's really doing. And I think this is an exciting time. And I think these tools, this deep learning, you know, is sort of a, a double-edged sword here. It's really awesome. You can go out and, you know, blaze through the jungle with this and just go and do industry and do amazing things like cure cancer. Or we can go in the other direction and figure out how the brain works. He uses is like almost like the, a, a new philosophy or a new th neuroscience or a new theoretical neuroscience about how our brain might actually do what it does, right? We still don't know how to explain experience and being alive in the sense of awareness, right? Like who's awake, alive, and aware in this room right now? What is that? We have no idea, right? Like maybe, right? There's more coffee. Um, and so we, we have no idea how to explain that stuff. So I think that's what's so exciting. You know, I encourage everybody to get into this field. It's just kind of like the early days. It's like the Wild West. Right? And so you can, you, can, you can jump into these experiments and take any kind of piece of data and start pulling it apart, even when you don't have labels. And so the, the tricky thing is, you know, getting all these labels. Well, here we've seen techniques you can do when you don't have labels. And so sort of any problem, there's no excuse not to try to think about how you can apply machine learning to it. Because if you have labels, then you can apply the supervised. And if you don't, well, then start making these dictionaries and see kind of what pops out. What, what does it show you? What do you see? Any questions, thoughts, comments, random ideas? Awesome. Well, thank you for so much time. We'll take a break. I think it's now it's time for lunch. And they bring Emily in because she has any announcements.